Welcome to the community panel at the Reimagining Sanctuary Conference. Our speakers today will be Sue Donaldson on sanctuaries as communities, Indra Lahiri on community among sanctuaries, and Anna Barini on sanctuaries and their local community. So let me introduce Sue first. Sue Donaldson is a co-founder of the Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law, and Ethics Research Cluster at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Sue is also a co-author of Zoopolis, A Political Theory of Animal Rights, and the author of numerous journal articles, two of which um, I've shared as recommended readings for today, uh, for this week, uh, in the discussion forum. Those articles were based on the research trip that she and others affiliated with that research cluster have made to farmed animal sanctuaries um, in the United States and Canada. So uh, thank you so much, Sue, for taking the time to be with us today. And um, I know I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, and hello, everybody. I'm really thrilled to be part of this conversation. So thank you for the invite. Um, so today's theme is community and my talks about sanctuaries as communities. And I'm going to organize the talk in three sections. So first, I want to talk about how I see community as a key but neglected dimension of flourishing and freedom in, in sanctuaries. So neglected in comparison with the two more predominant ideas of individual and species flourishing. After that, I'll talk about what I mean by community uh, as a social concept uh, and how we can see sanctuaries as social communities. And third, I wanna consider the implications of thinking of sanctuaries as communities. So what are the implications for practice? Uh, and in this section, I will be echoing some of the themes from last week and in particular, Patrice's discussion of the presumption of competence and the privilege of risk. Okay, so that's sort of the organization. So to begin, why do I consider community the third and neglected dimension of flourishing and sanctuary? So let's start with the other two ideas that we need to put to one side, not because they're wrong, not at all, but just to distinguish them from the community question. So these two ideas are familiar features of sanctuary discourse and are fundamental to practice. First, many sanctuaries, when talking about what they do, emphasize that the animals in their care are persons, not things. Someone's, uh, not somethings. They are unique individuals with distinct personalities, histories, needs, and desires. This, of course, is a vital point to emphasize uh, in a world that reduces animals to their function for humans and to fungible and disposable objects uh, of use. So that's the first idea. Uh, secondly, many sanctuaries emphasize the importance of respecting animals as the distinct kinds of biological beings that they are. So as members of species who have specific, uh, who have species specific uh, needs and ways of living. This too is a vital message in a world that denies and distorts and frustrates animals' most fundamental biologically encoded needs and behaviors. So the animals and sanctuaries are unique individuals with their own personal needs and desires, and they are members of species with species-specific biological and psychological functionings. These two ideas quite rightly guide much of the excellent care work um, that takes place in sanctuaries. But I think they leave out the crucial question of social community. A community, as I'm using the term, isn't just an aggregation of individuals or a biological grouping. It's an inherently social idea concerning how we belong to different kinds of association. Associations like a, a family or a circle of friends or a neighborhood, a community group, a city, a nation, a political community, an identity group, um, many other possibilities. So belonging to community is what social theorists call a we experience. So it's a psychological experience of solidarity or connection or belonging held together by some social glue like identification or commitment or shared meaning uh, or embodied connection in day-to-day -day interaction and practice. 
you've probably all seen how the animals in sanctuaries form various kinds of groupings and subgroupings and how these function as we groups. So for example, a group of birds might appropriate a sunny perch or a bathing spot and lay claim to it saying, this is ours. Or resident animals might help out a confused newcomer showing them that this is how we do things around here. If your sanctuary is set up to allow animals of different species to mix together, you'll probably have seen that these we groups both uh, uh, occur within species and, and across the species line. Uh, so the way that individuals associate and see themselves as part of a we isn't necessarily tied to species membership. In my own home, for example, there's spouse Will, dog Roxy and Sue. Um, and we think of ourselves as a we, it's a social we, it's a family, not a species we. And the three of us, including Roxy, also see ourselves as belonging to other social we's, like the group of people and dogs who make up our small condo building, uh, or the group of humans and other animals who constitute our friendship circle, um, or those who live in the neighborhood. So we don't belong to just one we, but multiple overlapping and intersecting we's, which play different roles in our lives. So these multi-species examples alert us to the fact that the glue that holds together the sense of we isn't species or instinct-based. It's socially and culturally flexible and constructed. So now we're talking about a social community and not just a random aggregation of unique individuals uh, without a connecting glue and not a biological group connected by some evolutionary script. So what is this glue that connects us in social groupings? And this is where the idea of social norms comes in. So social norms have been called the grammar of society. They cover a vast range of behaviors that coordinate the action of members of social communities. They can be explicitly mandated like uh, laws or a matter of social convention or culture. They can be something we are consciously aware of um, like expectations about tipping or sending thank you cards. They can be habits that we initially learn and then don't consciously think about afterwards, like driving on the right side of the road. And they can also be behaviors that we never consciously learn, but just simply absorb by a kind of social osmosis, like how to keep the right social distance when talking with others, how to walk through a crowd without bumping or intimidating other people, how to modulate our voice in different environments, uh, and tons of other behaviors that allow us to be predictable and comprehensible to one another, to coordinate our actions, and to be appropriately responsive to one another. This social coordination, uh, this layering of simple and complex norms about how to be and how to do things, is something we figure out and create together over time as part of social and cultural processes. We can contest these norms and change them, even the ones that have operated before the low uh, conscious awareness, as I think we've all learned about personal space and uh, contact during COVID. So for beings like humans and many other animals who can create, shape, and contest social norms, a crucial dimension of our flourishing or well-being is that we are active participants or agents in all of this social and culturally coordinated behavior uh, in this creation of community. So ideally, norms aren't simply imposed on us. We have some freedom to adopt norms, to create and shape them, to contest them, to pass them on to others. So let's return to the sanctuary setting and consider some of the ways that social norm-based community is operating there. I'm going to talk about a number of examples, and these are derived from the uh, group research project that Patrice alluded to. So this was conducted at Vine a few years back uh, with seven of my colleagues from Queens, um, and I'm specifically drawing from the, the paper that um, I co-authored with Charlotte Blattner and Brian Wilcox. So we observe different kinds of norms operating at Vine, and these include norms of belonging. Uh, so who belongs here? Who is a visitor and is greeted and checked out? Who's an unwelcome presence and chased away? We observe norms of care and consent in embodied interaction, the way animals learn to navigate space and context so as not to harm or annoy one another, cows and sheep stepping carefully over chickens and ducks underfoot, everyone being careful of their horns and beaks and teeth and hooves, their sheer body size, norms about keeping a distance or snuggling up, about grooming uh, and other kinds of contact. We observe norms related to social roles. 
So like the role that Alpaca Domino has taken on at Vine um, of greeting visitors when they arrive, or Cow Autumn stepping into the role of mother by adopting a, a calf newcomer, or other animals who help um, take on roles like integrating newcomers and teaching them the ropes or taking on the job of guarding others from predator threats or the role of peacemaker intervening between parties who are fighting. In addition, there are all the norms related to daily and seasonal routines. So expectations about well, what things will happen, when and how. Individuals and groups can plan around these routines, anticipate them, chafe against them, propose new ones. Some of these routines are initiated and managed by humans, uh, like the daily round of being released or closed back into the coops, uh, health checks, mealtimes, many others. But there are also countless routines that the animals create. So like their patterns of movement from place to place in the sanctuary is part of their daily routine of enjoying the sun in this spot or sitting with some friends and then exploring the woods. Um, norms about who has dibs on what spaces for what purposes around food sharing uh, and many other things, all navigated across the species line through the creation and reinforcement of expectations and patterns. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of the layers of social norms that are operating in a sanctuary community and the active role animals are playing in creating and sustaining them. I imagine you could all suggest many more examples of norms in relation to comportment, interaction, roles, practices, and routines operating in your own sanctuaries. Moreover, I would suggest that the cumulative effect of these social norms is a major factor in giving to your sanctuary its distinctive character, whatever that is, its ethos or, or culture. So if we ignore the social and cultural dimension, it's very easy to look at a sanctuary to look at the fences, at the humans determining the layout and structure of buildings, managing care and safety, and all the other imposed routines and constraints. It's easy to look at all this and see this is a place where animals aren't really free. They may be safe and loved and well cared for, but their lives are highly regulated by humans, including the imposition of many paternalistic actions, which animals might, might not want um, uh, or, or like. So this is the care and captivity paradox uh, that Patrice spoke of last week. But by looking at social norms and community, I believe we start to see a more new, nuanced picture of what constitutes freedom and flourishing in sanctuary, uh, sanctuaries as communities. So first, as I just noted, animals themselves are creating, communicating, and reinforcing many of these norms as when they take on the social roles as greeter, teacher, elder, guardian, Secondly, even in those cases where humans initiate or create a norm, animals frequently contest or shape or repurpose the norms. Um, so here are some more examples from Vine. Vine humans used to approach chickens in the open to pick them up for health checks. The chickens objected to this, so Vine tried other arrangements and landed on the practice of picking up the chickens uh, um, as they exited the coop each morning, an arrangement with the chickens much preferred and is now the default practice. Another example, an infirm cow elder continually went to the gate that separates the middle sanctuary commons from the more rugged upper pasture where a herd of cows live uh, more independently, indicating her desire to join them. Vine humans resisted her request at first because her health was frail and they didn't think she could cope very well with challenging winter conditions in the upper pasture. But her ongoing persistence made it clear that this was very important to her and Vine acquiesced in her decision. So these are instances of resisting norms and getting them changed. But what about reshaping practices or creating entirely new multi-species norms? Our research group also saw instances of this. So a very obvious case was the way the animals would transform the purpose that humans intended for objects or routines. So for example, when a tub of water was placed in an area of the sanctuary that needed more fresh water, um, three geese took it over as a private swimming pool. And I'm sure you've encountered many similar examples of animals altering your human intention for objects and spaces and routines. 
But what was particularly fascinating to us was how animal, animal residents were not just contesting or shaping norms in light of their individual interests, like a desire for a good swimming or sleeping spot, but they were developing community level kinds of social meaning, actively creating that glue I was talking about earlier that pulls together a collective sense of we. For example, uh, at Vine, there's a regular bi-weekly food distribution of uh, produce donations from the local Hannaford grocery store. Um, and our group was fortunate to take part in the distribution one day. Animal residents look forward to this occasion, anticipating it on the day, watching for the delivery truck full of big blue boxes of every imaginable fruit and veg, uh, then gathering excitedly and waiting for the distribution to begin. So there was a celebratory feeling uh, to the distribution on the day we took part. We researchers were on one side of the fence doling and tossing out goodies uh, while the animals mostly gathered around the other side of the fence, though some like chickens, turkeys and ducks were underfoot on both sides. So we were distributing food and at a certain point someone realized that the alpacas were in the very thick of things but not actually eating any of the food. So clearly they wanted to be part of the activity but what activity? It wasn't about the food. And so we started to see how this activity, this communal gathering, which the humans thought of as a free food distribution, was in fact something more than that in the mind of at least some of the animals. It was an occasion for gathering in the commons as a group, for being part of a shared excitement together, a party, a ritual, something in any case that was more than a functional food transaction. And Patrice has subsequently confirmed to me that this wasn't just the one off uh, observation. So by stepping back in this way and looking at all the ways the animal residents are shaping life at Vine, shaping the actions of the humans, creating community and meaning, shaping a Vine culture in fact, we can see that there is potentially a lot of meaningful freedom and self-determination that can occur amongst animals in a sanctuary setting, despite the fact that humans control so many parameters. Just because the larger context is one of captivity and there is unremitting hostility to animals in the larger society, doesn't mean that we can't create subcontexts of meaningful freedom and flourishing in community. So creating and nurturing this space of freedom and co-determined community doesn't just happen. It's true that animals and sanctuaries as everywhere else, as everywhere else uh, will contest and shape their circumstances. They will create community and culture at every opportunity if they can. Um, but most of the time we constrain that. Uh, and so human action can either enable and support this kind of agency or control and suppress it almost entirely. So how can sanctuaries support the freedom of animals to create and sustain social and cultural community? And here I echo some of Patrice's remarks about the presumption of competence and privilege of risk. So do sanctuary spaces and operations open up possibilities or shut them down? Are routines and practices organized for human convenience and cost or to create and respond to animals cultural um, and community initiatives. Are safety concerns handled primarily by using segregation and confinement and surgery, or by ensuring there is enough space and opportunity for animals to sort certain things out for themselves, to figure out how to take care of each other, to manage disputes, to tolerate or avoid their foes, to create their own norms, rituals, and routines. If animals persistently contest certain practices, is the response to double down in the name of safety or to step back and find a better way? And maybe to ask whether individuals should be able to take certain decisions for themselves even uh, at some risk. Perhaps most importantly, are the humans always looking and listening for ways that animal residents are creating community? And then are they helping in these efforts or getting in the way? Thinking of sanctuary as community gives us a different perspective on some uh, ongoing thorny issues, I think, in the sanctuary context. Um, and I don't have time to talk about many of these, but I will talk briefly about the issue of intake and transfer, uh, which Lori talked a little bit about last week. So think about how after an individual animal has lived at Vine or some other sanctuary for some months, they've learned a great deal about how things happen at Vine. 
Also how, um, as they've developed security and knowledge, they have themselves been able to shape those goings on at mine. Think about how much their knowledge of other individuals, friend, foe, or indifferent, of the physical environment, the local wild animals, the routines and practices of the sanctuary. Think about how much their identity is now wrapped up in this community and feeling part of it uh, and being competent in it um, and how their ability to be self and co-determining is based on this diverse knowledge and experience they have acquired, uh, acquired over time. Now, think what it would mean for such an individual to be transferred to an entirely new sanctuary community. So even if they're moved with a few best friends, a whole world of meaning is suddenly wrenched away and they need to start over in terms of building up the knowledge and relationships that will enable certain important dimensions and freedom. Um, this individual has gone from being an expert, someone deeply embedded in a web of social and cultural relations someone who knows the ropes and plays a particular role or roles in the community to being a novice and outsider. I'm not saying, not at all, that animals should never be moved between communities or that in some cases the move might ultimately be beneficial for an individual. All I'm saying is that it's really important to be aware, I think, of what such movement might be costing an, an individual in terms of their community belonging um, and, and the cost to the community, of course, that loses her. Similarly, it's important to think about intake into the community. So newcomers obviously are great for community. They give re residents a chance to welcome, teach and integrate and to learn and be changed in turn. And community thrives on infusion of new ideas and ways of being. And I should add, it thrives on diversity of individuals and all ages and abilities being represented. That's how elders can be elders and kids can be kids. Um, but there's a sweet spot in terms of the pace of, of change um, and maintaining sufficient continuity and stability. Uh, I think this is quite crucial to Sanctuary's community. So a continuous intake of many newcomers can easily overwhelm community if there is insufficient time uh, to get to know one another, to heal, to integrate practices and meanings, and to learn the local culture. So intake and transfer of animals isn't just a process that affects individuals in need, but something that affects the entire character, vitality, and resilience of the community as a whole. Okay, um, time for me to wrap up. Um, so why should we be concerned with this community dimension of sanctuary? Most importantly, as I've tried to suggest, because domesticated animals are social beings and community matters to them. That sense of belonging, of purpose, accomplishment and meaning that comes from being a member of a we community. I also think that taking this perspective on sanctuary is a way of infusing everyday sanctuary practice with even deeper purpose and meaning that it already has. And I would add joy, the joy of fostering belonging, um, and of experimenting and exploring with animal world makers. So if our long-term goal is not simply then the war against animals, but to find new and better ways of living with them, then I think we need to think about community now and not just in some better future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sue, uh, for that thought-provoking presentation. And I'm sure I'm the only one who might, not the only one who might have looked like they weren't listening because they were scribbling so many things um, that you were saying. Um, so, and then I kept realizing, wait, it looks like I'm not listening. And then looking up. Uh, so thank you so much. You said so many things that were were fascinating and, I, and I'm going to want to think about. Um, but we need to move on. Uh, and let me introduce someone who to most of you will need uh, no introduction, and that is Indra Lahiri, uh, the founder of Indra Loka Sanctuary. And I hope that uh, uh, Indra will be talking a bit about Indra Loka and, and the things that Indra Loka does. Uh, but Indra is also the, the uh, in convener and, and person who does most of the work behind the Global Coalition of Farmed Animal Sanctuaries, which is a group on Facebook, 
um, that any uh, that anyone can apply to join. So please uh, think about joining that group if you use that social media platform. Um, there, Indra not only fosters community by providing a safe place for dialogue and for people to ask questions, but she also does things like organize uh, roundtables on issues like fundraising, try to, trying to help people solve the problems with insurance, so many very practical things and also so many social things. Um, and, uh, and maybe it's not surprising then to learn that that, that previously to starting Indra Loka, Indra uh, was a, a coach and consultant on specifically on, on communicating across differences, uh, which is something I found her to be very skilled at. Uh, so I'll stop talking and, um, and introduce Indra Lahiri to talk about uh, community among sanctuaries. Thank you so much, Patrice. And thank you, Sue. That was really just so engaging and you had so many things to think about that I, I think we're all going to be pondering your talk for a little bit. Uh, so thank you for that. I want to share my screen um, because I'm I can't learn from myself. I know nothing. Um, so I'm I, what I'm going to share with you is is lessons that I've learned about uh, community. Um, from four different elders, and um, then just share with you my thoughts on how to uh, how that might apply to us as a community of sanctuaries. And then perhaps I'm really hoping that our our discussion this weekend and on the discussion board, and you know even possibly today if there's time, will be quite fruitful. I I really want to hear from everybody on what you all want from community because there's no reason we can't create the community of sanctuaries that we want. So. Enough of that. I'm going to, to, to tell you about some of these elders that I've learned from. Um, Duncan and Nugget are two of them. They are two pigs um, who have been, who've taught me met many, many things in addition to teaching me about community and also um, two humans that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that you probably have heard of also. So this is Duncan and Nugget. Duncan's the one kissing Nugget. When Duncan and Nugget were young pigs, they taught me how much pigs like fun and freedom. I didn't have a fence on the property that could hold them in. Sometimes they adventured on site simply by visiting animals in other pastures and barns. They were never aggressive and were always met by the others, no matter how big or small or grumpy or territorial, with friendly curiosity. Sometimes they adventured off site. Sometimes they went swimming in the creek. Once they visited my neighbor's cows and he threatened to shoot them if he ever saw them again, claiming they were dangerous. After that, I knew I had to keep them on site, which meant that we had to make it interesting enough for them to want to stay. And this is a picture of Duncan with Chandra. We needed to provide much more interaction and enrichment for them. We rescued more pigs as well as encouraging visits to other pastures as Duncan and Nugget requested. We had a few other free range animals at the sanctuary in those days, a cow named Penny, three mischievous goats, a lot of birds and a lot of cats, uh, and a mini pig. Uh, so when people visited, they were amazed to witness these cross species interactions. For example, you might see two mini pigs tending to a foundered horse, uh, a cow grooming a chicken, or a cat napping on a sheep's back. Duncan, Nugget, Penny and all the others had created a community, a vibrant, loving, inclusive, diverse community. And to be honest with you, that is the first true community that I have ever lived in. It felt just as warm and supportive as the stereotyped small towns on Hallmark movies that they try to capture, uh, but maybe with more authenticity as well as more eccentricity. So. Years later, when Duncan and Nugget were old men, they became the kindly grandfather figures to countless frightened new rescues. This is Duncan with Blinken. At that point, Duncan and Nugget had decided to make their home with the elderly sheep flock. At around that time, we rescued an alpaca named Sandy, who's here in this photo with Sunita, her friend. Sandy had been on the brink of death. Meningeal worms had penetrated her brain, curtailing her ability to stand and walk. 
In order to help her heal, we needed to lift her up to a standing position several times each day. The plan was to progress to helping her take a few steps and go from there until she could walk. But in the beginning, she was so traumatized and terrified of humans that we caused her significant panic when we even approached her to lift her up. So this brought us to an ethical question, balancing her desire not to be handled by us with her quality of life. Life isn't much for a grazing animal that can't walk. This was also a question of community and the kind of community we want to be at Indraloka. Do we force people to be part of our community? That doesn't feel right. We decided to ask the other animals for help since Sandy was not afraid of them and to work on gaining her permission to help her. We decided to introduce Sandy to Duncan, Nugget and their sheep family. A number of members of this family suffer from arthritis, including Duncan and Nugget. They sometimes struggle getting up and they're a little creaky first thing in the morning. So we often gave them a hand getting up and spent extra time on their hooves, wanting to keep them all as mobile as possible. I'm sure many of you are in the same boat with elderly groups. The sheep and Duncan and Nugget are all very trusting of their human family and felt comfortable with us handling their hooves and occasionally lifting them up. And they were all also very welcoming for newcomers. So I'm just gonna put it right out there. I talked to the animals. I don't expect them to answer in words, but I know that they understand my heart. And I also know that they understand my body language and my voice tone, most of my words. And that's how I understand what they say to me by paying attention to the vocal expressions that they have and how they say that, but also their body language, their voice tones, and through understanding them through relationship with them, you know, knowing, knowing what's in their hearts. So I sat down with the whole family, Duncan, Nugget, and the sheep, and I asked them if they would help Sandy. They agreed, and they did. Oh, this is, a, this is pictures in the wrong order, but here's Duncan again in his wallow. <laughs> Sandy with her sheep friends. Sandy bonded profoundly with her new family and with Duncan and Nugget most of all. This came as no surprise to us. Duncan and Nugget both possessed the ability to make people of all species feel loved and safe. They were just so grounded and firmly rooted in their knowing. Time marched on. Sandy started to trust us and learn to walk again. And Nugget's arthritis slowly took over until one day he laid down in the swallow and couldn't rise back up. Sandy and several of the sheep watched anxiously as we used the large animal glide to pull him to dry land, while Duncan and the others watched more calmly, albeit a bit sadly. They had seen this kind of thing before. Even with help and equipment, Nugget couldn't stand. It was time to say goodbye. And they all did it with such love and grace and care for one another. Afterwards, Duncan laid down sadly. The sheep and Sandy just huddled around him, wrapping him in wool and hopes and noses and just holding steady while he cried. For months after, Sandy always kept Duncan in her sight. Duncan, Nugget, Sandy, Penny, and all of the animals at the sanctuary have taught me what a community can be. It can be a family. It can be love. It must be, I would posit, rooted in, sorry, I have slides out of order. Oh, I see what I'm doing. Rooted in kindness and compassion, a genuine rejoicing of each other's triumphs and genuine support for one another. So I'd like to kind of throw this out there and see if maybe you would all just use your chat feature and, um, and share and also, you know, jot notes for yourself so that we can have, you know, more discussion on the weekend about this too. But what are some words or phrases that describe what you hope our community of sanctuaries could be like? So did anyone else here start their sanctuary completely on their own? There's a little raise hands feature at the bottom if you want to raise your hands. I, I made that mistake. Uh, those early days were so, so hard. 
And there were times I found myself just collapsed in a heap on the ground, sobbing, I need help. I was so frightened of not being enough for them. And I wasn't, how could I have been? I see a lot of hands here. Yeah, so I wasn't the only one who, who did that. Um, and I, I don't know if you felt that way too, but I, I literally would collapse on the ground in the middle of trying to do a million things and sob, I need help, I'd scream to the universe, I need help. I was so frightened. It's just, what I didn't know then is that this is too big a job to do alone. It's too hard. Trying to do it alone sets us up for failure. Last week during her ethics talk, Patrice mentioned interdependence. So I wanna find that slide back that I, went, sorry about this. Here we go. Thich Nhat Hanh made a similar point when he wrote, to be is to interbe. You cannot just be by yourself alone. You have to interbe with every other thing, every other living thing. That's an important piece of this. We have to interbe and not just with those we want to interbe with. I was perfectly content interbeing with my beloved multi-species family when there were no other humans as part of that family. But like Sandy, I desperately resisted interbeing with humans. In fact, in the early days of Indraloka, I reacted the same way as Sandy did to humans in her early days with us, with abject terror. So I covered it up with reserve and brusqueness, but the bottom line was that I was terrified of humans. I had seen them at their worst. Sandy and I both knew what it was to suffer helplessly at the hands of those bigger and stronger than us. And we had another thing in common too. Sandy and I continued to react to humans in terror, even after the ones that hurt us were long gone. Even when humans present only wanted to help. Even when the choice was to trust or die, our terror made us want to choose to die versus trust other humans. So in her talk on ethical decision-making uh, at sanctuaries, Lori Gruen mentioned the importance of self-care to our ability to make ethical decisions. She pointed out that if we're burned out, if we're angry, if we're tired or otherwise unwell, we're not as clear-headed as we need to be to navigate the difficult ethical issues that we face daily as sanctuary people. So the same is true with community. We cannot be in a healthy community unless each of us takes responsibility for ensuring our own health. Sandy and I were not ready to be members of a community that included humans. Our fear closed that possibility off. Now, Fear shows up in a lot of different forms. So you have to develop enough insight to recognize it or anything else that might be going on in your head or your heart. If you don't develop that insight, you're blocking the opportunities for community because you can't even see them. So it could feel like this person irritates me. It could feel like this person bores me or this person does X, Y, Z thing that is wrong. Uh, this person is, insert judgment here, right? Not smart, rude, hoarder, incompetent, uh, whatever judgments you have. So the key is that when we notice any of those feelings, it's a clue from ourselves about ourselves. Not about that person we think it's about. And taking care of ourselves means sitting with those feelings and thoughts and examining them and seeking to understand what they have to teach you about yourself. Sandy and I both got lucky. This is Sandy with Rosie and Sunita. Our love and trust in Duncan and Nugget helped us start to love and trust humans the way that they did. Slowly, cautiously, a step at a time. Sandy and I both learned to walk among the living and even to rejoice in the beauty of walking with others. And because I put in the time and effort to get to know my own mind and heart, I know that today I'm ready to be a giving and useful member of a healthy community. But the moment I drop the ball on my self-care, the minute 
I forget to feed my spirit or nurture my soul, I am no longer capable of being a useful member of the community. When we fall down, others can and certainly should help us as we get back to our feet. But the majority of us need to be healthy the majority of the time if we truly want to create a sanctuary community that in the end create better lives for formerly farmed animals. Ubuntu, Desmond Tutu explained, is, a very is very difficult to render into a Western language. It speaks of the very essence of being human. When we want to give high praise to someone, we say, you, un Ubuntu. Hey, so-and-so has Ubuntu. Then you are generous, you are hospitable, you are friendly and caring and compassionate. You share what you have. It is to say, my humanity is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life. My life is inextricably tied up with all the life that depends on this earth too. We belong in a bundle of beingness. My sanctuary is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of sanctuaries. Sanctuary work is too hard to do alone. And there are enough sanctuaries now that we don't have to do it alone anymore. Let's lean on each other. Let's hold each other up when we need to. Let's lift each other up whenever we can. Let's let the terror of the past rest in the past. And let's move forward with hope in the manner of rescue pigs everywhere, including Sweet Nugget and Duncan. A big part of setting the tone for a healthy community is healthy elders and the wisdom they impart. And so that's why I decided to share with you the lessons that I learned from four influential teachers in my life, Duncan and Nugget, Thich Nhat Hanh, and Desmond Tutu. Interestingly enough, all of them have recently passed away and some of them quite recently. So I think it's a good time for us to examine our thoughts and assumptions and dreams for the community of sanctuaries as a backdrop to and preparation for this weekend's contemplation and dialogue on community. So Patrice mentioned that I had started a few years ago a group that we called the Global Coalition of Farm Sanctuaries. And um, we pulled some volunteers together in the beginning and things kind of, um, you know, people get busy with sanctuaries and things kind of drifted. I am putting this out there. I'm happy to make that coalition into whatever all of you want, if you want it. Um, or I'm happy to help form some other system of all of us working together. Uh, I would very much like to have some help doing that. I don't think it's appropriate for me to do it alone. But I think part of what we need to do as we think about this is ask ourselves, what is community? The lessons imparted by these four elders indicate that community is, in part at least, mutually supportive, engaged, inclusive, allowing and encouraging a broad range of diversity, rooted in shared values, assuming the best of one another. I think this is important, especially when we talk about sanctuaries, to be very honest with you. I think we could do better with assuming the best of one another, wanting the best for one another, forgiving one another, and upholding mutually agreed upon norms. How do we demonstrate respect for each other? How do we work through disagreements? Can we agree on a set of ethics. And that is something that I put, I shared in the um, discussion group page as well. Uh, it was a code of ethics that was drafted years ago as part of the Global Coalition of Farm Sanctuaries. Again, everything's open for discussion here. We can change it, we can modify it, we can throw it away, we can decide we don't want a code of ethics. I'm just putting it out there to see if it's useful. And if it's not, it's not. So what I am suggesting is that we use this weekend's discussion and the discussion board as a launching pad to intentionally create the community of sanctuaries that we wish to be. Again, if you want, we can make that the Global Coalition of Farm Sanctuaries as the home of that community, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, I'm happy to step back and others can run it. Um, I'm happy to help, but I can't and I shouldn't do it alone. So this is going to beg some more questions that we need to consider. What does a community of sanctuaries look like? What do we do for and with one another? What does it feel like? 
I'd really like to hear your thoughts on all of these things. Um, and I'd really like to have a, a serious discussion about it because I do think that we can make each other's lives much better and in the end do much better work for the animals if we can support each other. So the question is then, how would we support each other? What are some ideas for that? And I want to hear about all of that as well. Um, here's some thoughts that I had. Some of these we've started trying to do with the Global Coalition, some we haven't. Um, you know, shared knowledge. So we've been doing a lot of webinars. Um, they're completely free for, for anyone, any sanctuary person that wants to join the Global Coalition to join. And by the way, we have um, two coming up. We'll be announcing a date soon. Um, on fundraising. Uh, we may even add a, a few more and do like a, a, little, a little series on fundraising, since that seems to be a challenge for all of us all the time. And there's always so much more we can do. Mutual support. So we've done grief circles that Patrice has very kindly volunteered to, uh, to lead. Um, and that's something we can continue to do. Think, what else can we do to support each other with burnout and compassion fatigue, and even just sharing ideas, even some just logistic ideas like, you know, how do you keep your chickens warm in winter? You know, <laughs> there's all kinds of things that we can share, right? There's also potential research that we could do together. For example, what if we created a survey of sanctuary visitors that we got some of our wonderful academics uh, who are here on the call to get involved with helping us to design? And what if we had that same survey gone to sanctuary visitors across the world? And what if we could then compile results and then we would all be able to very clearly say from a huge, a huge base of respondents what the results are of visiting a sanctuary. Now, clearly it's gonna vary from sanctuary to sanctuary, but there may be some things on the top level that would be very, very useful for all of us to know. So that's just an, just an example. We could even think about shared resources. We have tried a couple of times um, with, you know, sharing um, sharing resources in terms of insurance. Um, there's other things, you know, we could get back office support, um, do employee welfare type ideas. Um, you know, maybe we keep a therapist on retainer, all of us together at once, and the therapist is available to any of us uh, in the sanctuary community who aren't struggling with compassion fatigue. I mean, these are all just possible ideas, right? We could purchase things together. You know, muck boots are cheaper as a group, right? <laughs> so, or, you know, they're just, these are just ideas to get you thinking, but I want to, I want to hear everybody's ideas. I think I put Sunday on this and I think it might be on Saturday. So we need to, yeah. Okay. So it's Saturday. Don't get confused by my Sunday. It was last weekend was Sunday. This weekend is Saturday. Um, so again, I just ask if you're, if you're interested and if you're willing, let's use the Saturday afternoon discussion and the discussion board to talk about next steps. And um, I, I would love for us to create whatever it is that we can create to make this work joyful and supported and much less frightening. I don't want any one of us crumbling on the ground and sobbing, I need help. We're here and we can help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Indra, um, for, for that um, thought-provoking and moving presentation, as well as all of the work that you have done fostering community among sanctuaries um, and all that I know you have or will be doing to, to, to follow up on, on this presentation. Um, I know a lot of people, uh, uh, I'm seeing chats come in uh, that, that folks, are, folks are excited about the ideas right. that, you, that you're bringing up. Right. Um, and you know what, we can um, talk about all this, not just uh, the, the, this, this coming discussion, but uh, uh, on the very last discussion of the whole month, um, I think we'll have some time also to talk about uh, what do we want to do uh, as a group together going forward? Fantastic. I should just say one other thing. If you need to reach me, I'm not a social media person. There are social media accounts that have my name on them, but I, I, I'm rarely on them. So if you want to reach me, email me, indra at indraloka.org. Okay, I'll put it in the chat. Um, that's the best way. And then we can, you know, 
find some time that works and we can actually get on the phone and talk to each other in person. And I love it when that happens, even though I'm scared every time I, before I get on the phone with someone, but then it's wonderful. And I, um, and I, I appreciate the connection. Me too, terrified every time I have to talk to humans. Just saying. Um, uh, I love it that we're talking about all these different aspects of community today. And for our third presentation, um, let, me in, it, uh, let me introduce Anna Barini, uh, who uh, coordinates humane education and community engagement here at Vine, um, and who also uh, serves on the local library board of trustees. Uh, and participates in numerous community, local community efforts, ranging from anti-racist demonstrations to dancing in the annual performance of the Nutcracker as a snowflake. Um, Anna is here uh, to talk about an, yet another aspect of community, and that is sanctuaries and their local communities. Take it away, Anna. Thank you, Patrice. Yes, it's true. I am a snowflake uh, every year in the our community production of The Nutcracker. Highly recommend ballet or dance as a way to kind of deal with compassion fatigue or burnout that um, Indra was talking about. So I'm talking about communities and their little uh, sanctuaries and their local communities. And um, as y'all were signing up, one of the things we did was ask what you were looking for out of each one of these panels. And almost everyone um, that signed up mentioned getting more involved in their local community. So some of you all are looking for ideas about how to do this. Some are looking to more intentionally build community with local volunteers, and others are looking to feel less anxious in reaching out to a community that's based in animal agriculture. So sanctuaries are and can be extremely important parts of their local community. Um, and as I move through this talk, I just want you to remember that everything I say is an idea. This isn't an exhaustive list and that building community takes time. Um, there's a lot of new sanctuaries here or smaller sanctuaries that are still getting their feet underneath them. And right now you're probably focused on animal care and building barns and finding funders and that's okay but reaching out to your community is important and it's worth the time but it does take that that resource that no one has which is time um and it's a step-by-step -step type of situation um so i'm hoping that everything um is kind of sparks our imagination and that you get some really good ideas for how to reach out to your local community so why should we be involved um, with the places that we live? So local partnerships can lead to mutual aid. They can bring more attention and potentially more supporters and donors to your sanctuary. This is extra important right now because foundation support for sanctuaries is declining. Um, local partnerships can create feelings of solidarity that make people more willing to listen to our messages about veganism and animal rights. Local partnerships can lead to a feeling of home in a place surrounded by animal agriculture. Um, these partnerships can spark conversations about veganism and animal rights. Um, you know, somebody might see you out at a local event and then end up having a conversation over dinner about what they learned. Um, partnerships with organizations like your Humane Society or local animal control officers or the equivalent in your area can help with rescues and alerting the sanctuary to situations of abuse and neglect. And um, partnerships with a local business can maybe help with fundraising or a discount on a big purchase like working with a local car dealership. Um, but most importantly, all of us and the animals in our care have an interest in human communities that are equitable, cooperative, generous, caring, nonviolent, and environmentally sustainable. Anything we do to improve the quality of our local communities will be worthwhile. So what are some ways that we could be involved? Um, there's a lot, but here's, here's a few. Arts programming, vegan cooking classes, gardening classes. Um, most of us are in rural areas and a lot of folks garden and it's a great kind of entry point to talk about some of these, um, to talk about veganism and animal rights and it gives you a, a nice starting point. Um, humane education programming. 
humane ed, not just for, for younger kids, but also teens, book clubs, potlucks, educational events about veganism, about social justice issues and film screenings. Um, you can co-sponsor events locally with somebody like your humane ed, uh, your humane ed, your humane society, excuse me, um, or your local library. You can provide food um, to local events. So get bring some vegan options. Um, environmental cleanups. In the state of Vermont, we have a day called Green Up Day where everybody in the state works together and um, like picks up trash on the side of the road. Organize something like that in your local community or maybe somebody already is and you can help co-sponsor it. And then of course, sanctuary tours and sanctuary fundraisers. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some ideas. So one of the things we did um, in preparation of this is Vine released a survey of sanctuaries to get an idea of kind of what we were already doing in our communities and to get a little bit more demographic information um, about where we're living. So some of the survey results. So 66% of the um, survey responders are located in rural areas. 40% of US sanctuaries are in predominantly white areas, but that number is probably higher. 50% um, 50 50 are located in predominantly conservative areas. So all of the survey responders have a strong working relationship with local or statewide vegan groups and most with animal rights groups. Um, there's fewer relationships with social justice or environmental organizations. About half have working relationships with local humane societies and or humane authorities. Far fewer have relationships with schools, libraries, domestic violence shelters, or local arts or civic improvement organizations. Almost everybody gives sanctuary tours and stages sanctuary fundraisers. About a third have humane education programs. About half hold vegan potlucks or educational events about veganism. Only a few offer gardening classes, arts events, or educational events about social or environmental justice. Um, most have attended events on behalf of the sanctuary and more than half, which is awesome, have called or emailed local organizations to express support or offer aid. And 90% say that attitudes toward the sanctuary are predominantly friendly. So overall, this is a story of opportunity. Many sanctuaries are located in rural conservative areas, exactly the places where anti-bias education is most needed and they're seen favorably, which puts them in a good position to be heard non-defensively. Sanctuaries are ideal places for talking about things like stereotypes, difference, and compassion for all. And um, something that I'm really looking forward to next week is the intersections panel that will include a talk on incorporating anti-racism into humane education. So many sanctuaries still have lots of room to develop the kinds of local relationships that will bring them support in many forms local libraries, arts organizations, and foster care programs, just to name a few, are potential sites of collaboration for things like bringing children to the sanctuary for humane education programs or co-sponsoring community events. So what are we already doing that works? Um, Indra Loka hosts an intuitive arts program for children and adults in their art barn that is super cool. And also how cool is it that they have an art barn? Um, and one of the survey respondents talked about a weekly free vegan food share for their unhoused neighbors, which is also amazing. Um, so what is Vine doing? That's who, that's who I can speak to is what we're doing. So what we do in our local community, um, we've hosted film showings with our local library. We do quarterly vegan potlucks. Obviously with COVID, this has been on pause, but they're really popular and super fun. Um, and our vegan potluck, we every year we do a Pride Month vegan potluck and it was our first Pride event in our area. So that's something you can also do is host a Pride event. Um, we have open volunteer days. So the community can come to the sanctuary, they get to volunteer and interact with the animals, and they also get to learn a little bit more about us and kind of put a face to the name. We're known in our neighborhood as the place with the emus because the emus will walk the fence line. And so people can then come and we can be more than just the place with the emus that stand at the gates. Um, 
We also do volunteer days with local businesses and groups. Um, our bank actually has a program where um, the employees get so many hours per year to volunteer. And so our, our, our bank has come to volunteer with us, and um, which was really nice. We co-sponsor um, a seed library at our local public library. So we do a lot with our library. And if I, if you take anything from this, I hope that you reach out to your librarians because librarians are super rad and they're always looking for cool stuff to do. And they would, they will love to work with you on so many different levels. Um, we also provide vegan snacks to different things. Patrice mentioned um, that I'm involved with different anti-racism um, demonstrations here in Springfield. For almost two years, we held a weekly Black Lives Matter vigil and Vine provided snacks um, because everyone loves an Oreo, um, it, which is, is a nice little break when you're standing out in the cold. Um, and then we are involved in the community on individual levels. Patrice and I both serve as library boards of trustees. Our animal care coordinator, Cheryl, volunteers with the local Humane Society, and one of our animal caretakers, Palm, has volunteered with different LGBTQ product projects. Um, and then finally, mutual aid. So Cheryl um, sewed, I don't know, like hundreds of masks at the beginning of the pandemic um, and in kid sizes to be passed out at our local library and our school. And we also have an incredible volunteer named Dave who does so much for the sanctuary. But one of the things he does is he also volunteers with our food bank. And there's a monthly fresh produce distribution. Well, if no one takes all the produce, it gets put into a landfill. So Dave diverts it from the landfill, brings it to Vine for the animals. We also pass it out to some people that are food insecure or we take perishable items, uh, non-perishable items, excuse me, to a local food shelf. So then the animals get that, we keep food out of the landfill and we also can pass along, um, we can pass along some food ourselves. And something that we're working on currently to be more involved in our community is with our school outreach. Um, we're involved with a lot of humane education programming, but I'm, I'm sure I'm having it's the, the, our schools are a tough nut to crack and I'm really working on it. And so that's something that I personally am working on is to get instead of just working with our local library and reaching some of the school children that way to actually get in their classrooms. So that was a lot. And just remember, if you're just starting out, it's a step by step process. When Vine first moved to Vermont, the first couple of years, we were just focused on the on the ground, getting everything together, setting up the sanctuary and building that community. Um, it's a step by step process, but you can all do it. I believe in you and we can rely on each other to come up with ideas. And I hope that um, this weekend we have some really good discussion about maybe what you're already doing and what's working in your communities. Thank you.